Pastor Adrian, thank you so much for uh, being here with me and having this conversation. I really appreciate it. A um, little icebreaker question for you. Okay. What is your favorite way to eat beef? Eat beef. Probably. You, you do eat beef. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I figured. Probably barbecued on the grill. Yeah. Always yeah. medium rare. Medium rare. Uh, yep. What do you season it with? Uh, Montreal Steak Spice. Yeah. Yeah. Is it charcoal grill or is it a propane? It's it's a natural, natural gas. Natural gas. Yeah, yeah. Right. A little easier than charcoal. Yes, but charcoal has a better flavor. Yeah. I'm a fan of charcoal. I've got oh. But but uh, if I had the natural gas hookup, I might. Yeah. Any any particular cut of beef? No, hey, what's ever a uh, reasonable price to yeah. a bit of a cheapskate. <laughs> but it's got to taste good and if you do it, got to marinate it right and then That's you're right. okay. If you cook, if, if, if you treat the steak properly, you can get a cheap cut and it'll still taste great. You got that right. Yeah. So tell me and tell us a little bit about about uh, your vision for the congregation here and uh, maybe some things that you have going on right now. Okay, appreciate that. Um, at this point, uh, first of all, just to give you a big background history, the church had a for sale sign on when I took over four years ago. Mm. And they were ready to close the church down. And they said, hey, could you help? And I said, well, I don't know. But we did, and God blessed. And uh, we've been rebuilding. Awesome. So we started with about 10 or 15 people. Now we're running two services. we got podcasts. we got a YouTube channel. Uh, we put a new roof on the church. So we've just been rebuilding and engaging the community with the love and care of Christ to show people that we not only love them and care about them, but that we want uh, to see uh, God's uh, life in a sense, and his message shown through their lives. Awesome. That's that's great. And uh, so has it been, um, tell me about that. Like, how, how do you take a church that's that's got a for sale sign on it and turn it into something that's growing and thriving? I think primarily the whole aspect is always building relationships. Everything in life is built on relationships. My relationship mm. with God and my relationship with people around me. So as a pastor, I like to spend time with people. That means going to the coffee shops, mm -hmm. restaurants. Yeah, food's always a good, good thing. So uh, It is a common theme. <laughs> yeah, it is. So even we had a couple that had, had been in church and had had knee surgery. And some wife said, well, we come we'll go over and visit them. And she said, what are you thinking? They said, let's bring a lasagna over and mm -hmm. some Caesar salad and let's have fellowship. Right. And nobody ever turns us down when that happens. No. They're like, oh, yeah, come on over. That's awesome. So we, we build, good. again, through relationships. Fantastic. Thank you. That's really good uh, wisdom. Um, now, a question for you. Does, does this congregation have any particular um, practices or traditions when it comes to funeral services? Um, and then yeah, I'll let you answer that. I'll go. Okay, specifically, no. Uh, right now, I would say we're a conglomeration of many different people coming from many, many different faith backgrounds. Okay. They're now coming in through Lighthouse. Um, but again, the, again, I'm going to say it's built on relationships. So even when we do funeral services or we meet with people, the idea is to sit down, to listen to p the people's heart, and to develop a service that is uniquely uh, that which represents the family and their wishes. Mm. But we always keep the message very clear. Right. And you had mentioned earlier that um, food and, and that support that you mm -hmm. have, is that something that um, the church would look to do as well, like to help support the family going through yes. those difficult times? Yeah, we actually had a family that really was not financially well off. And we said, let's step up. And we did. And we provided the food and fellowship. And uh, and looked after it, and they've even liked, uh, looked after some of the uh, expenses involved in that. And, oh, uh, wow. that's, that's beautiful. And it was just, there was no cost at all. We just wanted to bless mm. and encourage, because going through the grieving process of losing a loved one is tough enough as it is without being sometimes financially impoverished through the process. That's so true. Yeah, because it is not um, a cheap process many times to go through. So to have that financial support would be huge. Yep. Yeah. Um, can you tell me of a personal experience that you've had with death that has um, affected your perspective in life? Well, as a pastor, now this fall will be 41 years oh, wow. being involved in pastoral ministry. Uh, I've got a plethora of experiences that I could share with you. I think the primarily the one that affects you the most as a pastor or as an individual 
is when you have a, somebody that you love personally mm-hmm. uh, that goes through death. And for me, uh, it was my father who uh, was struggling with colon cancer and died in 1989. And I still remember mm-hmm. getting that phone call from my father and telling me that he had uh, colon cancer and that it had actually gone down into his... Um, it is spread, and as a result of that, he only had a couple months left, and he had told me on a phone call, I was pastoring in Halifax at the time, and uh, he shared with me at that point that he had already picked out his gravesite, and I just remember being stunned. How old was he at that time? He was, a, he had just, he was 54, he just turned 55 when he wow. died, so wow. he was a young man. No, unexpected. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. and that and that changed my, my whole perspective, because uh, when you walk with people through uh, grief and through dying, uh, you can try to be empathetic. You can try to be caring, but I gotta tell you, until you walk through it yourself, it's mm-hmm. a whole different story. Yeah. And I remember the people at the church I pastored feeling feeling that I was more empathetic and more caring. Oh, wow. As a result of going through what I did with my own father through mm. that process, and learning what it meant to grieve. Mm. Uh, you know, my mother's favorite saying: When things got tough as a kid, suck it up, Buttercup. <laughs> so we we didn't we didn't really grieve or cry about anything, right? But all of a sudden here we were faced with the death of our my dad and for my mom, uh, her husband, and uh, mm. we we had to learn what it meant to grieve. That was that was tough, but it was yeah. also educational. Learn to face the emotions, eh, and to go through that. Yep, it's not easy. No, yeah. And so some cultures really are good at grieving, and they they grieve loudly mm-hmm. and 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 out in front of everybody other cultures just shove that right down and try to be stoic and, and that that would be the dutch culture that i grew up with yeah very very much so yes yes uh I, actually one of my interviews someone had asked if if i cry much and i'm dutch german background and a little mm-hmm. bit of french canadian but Maybe that's maybe that's why I said oh I don't really I don't know why but it's hard. <laughs> yeah, I agree totally. But then other times, I can't stop. Uh, no, I can't stop. It's just it just comes out, and I even if I don't want it to, depending on the circumstance. I find that often happens when you're you're watching a, a movie flick. Yes, I sometimes watch romantic flicks with my wife, oh. and you see something sad happen, and all of a sudden, your emotions engage, and you start. You're tearing up and you're going, what's going on? Really? Where is this coming from? But the thing is, you're so used to holding it in that all of a right. sudden, you know, with your wife, you're watching this movie, all of a sudden these emotions come flooding to you that you just think to yourself, oh my goodness, where is this coming from? I haven't suppressed mine down enough yet for that to happen, but it will. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes sometimes for me, it's if, um, if I'm really touched it, it, deep in my heart mm-hmm. by some something that so maybe uh someone's done that i maybe i have so much gratitude for mm-hmm. and then that sometimes wells up yeah. the tears and but tears are tears are healthy i will say even though yeah. sometimes i might have a hard time with them uh tears are healthy and Absolutely. it's important yeah that's that's good so so that that affected your perspective and it also gave you um gave you a maybe more empathy when dealing mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. the grieving families in your church. Absolutely. That's great. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's hard to go through some things, but God can use those to touch other people because then you have that the extra um, sense of experience. care and sympathy. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a little bit different track. Is there, tr- speaking of tracks, um, any song or or maybe a smell or, or some some experience that you come across um, that brings you back to a time when you experienced uh, someone dying or a death in your in your life? Well, as a pastor, having officiated many funerals, there's one f- song that always comes up all the time okay. called "I Can Only Imagine." Oh, beautiful song! And, I, <clears throat> and yeah. again, when you listen to the words of that song, you just think to yourself, "Oh my goodness, I can't mm-hmm. think about this too deeply because I'm just, the tears are going to come." Yeah. And I, of course, I've watched the movie, the story behind that song, and uh, yeah, that really resonates with me in, in that yeah. regard. And that had to do with his dad, too, right? That's right. Yeah, that's a really good movie, I can only imagine, and an awesome song. Oh, yeah, yeah. very much so. Yeah, thank you. And another one that resonates with me, I remember uh, a gal sharing her story. I was walked with her through, uh, she had twin girls. They were involved in the Iwana program at a church I pastored. 
and I remember the girl uh, going to Six Children's in London, mm. and she was very jaundiced, and she actually died. Mm. And uh, but she, when she sang the the uh, not sang, but when this woman shared her testimony at our church after it was all said and done. Uh, the song by Casting Crowns, I Will Praise You in the Storm, oh my goodness. was, I, I've never, that song has such, such a, left an indelible memory upon me from hearing that song after what I saw that dear mom mm -hmm. go through with her daughter. Yeah. That was just huge. Absolutely. Now, you were telling me um, earlier that you run a grief program. Or you it's, help... called, it's called Grief Share Recovery. It's a 13-week program put okay. up by Church Initiative run it many times and uh, found it to be very effective. It's again, the whole context is small group. A lot okay. of times, sometimes uh, different organizations will put on a seminar with, and you can get two, 300 people. Right. Uh, I find in all honesty that it, it, it has some effect, mm -hmm. but I think the small group thing works a whole lot better because uh, we always share with people, you don't have to share your, your story if you don't want to, but as you know, yeah. Everyone inevitably shares their story because when you process your grief in the context of a group of seven to eight to ten people, there's things that are going to resonate with you, things you're going to like, oh, that's normal, oh, that's right. 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 And the idea is helping people on their journey of grief through this process to guide them uh, towards getting healing in their lives. And again, you know, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, uh, her book on death and dying, told about the fivefold cycle uh, that people go through in terms of grieving. And we find that it, it, the uh, fivefold cycle is not one that they go through in increments, it's one they kind right. of bounce back and forth all over the place. Yeah. But again, trying to let people know that what you're going through is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this process, and sometimes the other thing too is that when people are grieving through the process of death and loss, uh, each person does it at their own pace. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, I've heard this from people that I've worked with, well, aren't you over that yet? Oh, and I just, yes. just want to wring that person's neck when they, yeah. when they say that. Because like, the grieving process, yeah. just for different people, takes longer, mm -hmm. some it's shorter, and some take years. Yeah. Uh, but you have to allow people the, the time and space to kind of process through those emotions and through mm -hmm. those feelings. Uh, and... Uh, so the Grief Share program does that, and I've I've used it many many years, and continue to use it, and found it a real means of sometimes even through the process of helping people get healing in their lives, but also introducing to other people that are going through the process that can be very very helpful, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> also encouraging them in how to process grief in their lives because sometimes nothing really in life has prepared them how to process grief, right. like you said. There are cultures that grew up that are very good at doing that. Yeah. But then there's some cultures, like even the one I grew up in, where we didn't process grief. The only grief that we ever had was the Toronto Maple Leafs <laughs> losing the playoffs every single year. I did see them win one back in 1967, but I don't know if they're wow. going to win it again. <laughs> well, at least you have uh, strong hope. <laughs> yeah, we hope. We pray. Wow. It's interesting how you, how you mentioned that um, having it, Having them know what they're going through is normal mm -hmm. is helpful. Yeah. And that's something I'm learning more and more to make sure to mention, you know what, the things that you're going to go through in the next two days, in the next seven days, in the next mm -hmm. seven months, that that is normal. And it's so good if they're able to get in contact with other um, people who have gone or are going through those things to be able to share the normalcy of what they're going through because if you haven't gone through something like that before and then all of a sudden you're experiencing a depression mm -hmm. or you're you're angry at God or this or that and then and you're like where is this coming from and mm -hmm. this isn't normal but those things are normal and then that can really help uh, with that grieving process one of the things we encourage people and I always shake their head when I bring it up so uh, I often ask them what are you doing for exercise and they go look at me no, I'm not going to go lift weights in the gym. And I, <laughs> I kind of laugh about that. I said, I'm not even talking about that. But I said, if you yeah. do, it's good for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I said, really, in all honesty, I said, exercise really helps process the the pain and anguish in your body because mm. uh, your body builds up so much negative energy through this whole process of loss and death that to go for a walk every night or to go play ball or mm. to go for a swim, that as long as you're engaging in some kind of physical exercise, yeah. really helps 
in mm-hmm. the grieving process, which people so are yeah. rather surprised at. Yeah, no, it's very true. There are some groups that do walks, uh, walks at, at sp- gathered around that the grief, mm-hmm. and because it just helps you uh, work through that. And something I, I tell people when I'm usually when I'm sitting with someone mm-hmm. is is right that day or well, the, it's pretty raw. It's really raw, and I'll I'll have to remind them you need to eat. Yeah, uh, because yes. a lot of times they don't feel like you don't feel like eating, mm-hmm. and so but eating is very important and exercise also really important to be able to help you uh, process and and it just gives your body the energy that it needs to go through the work of grief because it's not easy. Another thing that we caution people through when they're going through the grieving process, don't make crazy decisions right now. Don't sell the house. (laughs) Don't sell the car. Don't just just take your time. Give it at least a year before Mm -hmm. you make any specific decisions in your life because that's right. how you're feeling now is not how you're going to be feeling a year from now and things don't have to be done right away exactly that's another thing sometimes people it's the day after and they're seeing me and they go okay do i start closing bank accounts do i do this no 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 no. no. just it is not a rush exactly uh, like almost any everything can wait pretty much and you just take your time yeah yeah and so uh that's been very helpful one thing too that i've noticed uh Dan, is that a lot of these individuals that uh, lose a loved one get a dog. Yeah. They don't get cats. <laughs> well, some do, but <laughs> some might. Uh, they need help then. If they Dogs do, are a good therapy. Yeah even, yeah, even for my mom who lost her, yeah. her second husband uh, through a heart attack, right. now has a dog. Yeah. So my wife said, if I ever die, I'm going to be replaced by this big dog. So, oh, no, okay, great. But the, I'm thinking of Bull Mastiff yeah, or there, Rottweiler. Yeah, yeah, Rottweiler probably more than likely. But <laughs> the idea is that to provide companionship. Yes. And I found yeah. that helps quite a lot. Another thing that a dog, I was just thinking about, that a dog might provide is um, redirecting some of the energy that you had been putting into uh, taking care of your loved one. Mm-hmm. And you were pouring, pouring in sometimes for yeah. years into that that person and helping them through what they're going through Mm -hmm. and then um and then and all of a sudden that outlet is gone so it's healthy to be able to redirect some of the energy that you had been pouring into there to something else and and taking care of a dog taking care of a puppy would definitely help yeah sometimes too we work with people in terms of that when a loved one passes away especially if they've been looking after him for a long time Mm -hmm. There's this euphoria, a sense of release. Mm. Oh, I feel so good now. And then they feel guilty. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, why should I be feeling so good when my loved one who I've cared for for X number of years has passed? That's right, yeah. But there's a sense of release because of the, there is a burden Absolutely. involved in caring for yeah. someone who's dying and who's struggling. Mm-hmm. And there is, there is this innate sense of relief that once it's happened, you feel a sense of relief. But then, again, the loneliness hits at that point, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, now is your opportunity to ask me as a funeral director anything. Well, Dan, it's uh, kind of uh, interesting you should ask that question. I'm just uh, intrigued as to why you got into the business. Yeah, um, good question. I never thought about becoming a funeral director. I wondered. I, uh, my dad's a pastor, and people would always ask, are you going to be a pastor like your dad? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and I saw the heavy burden that a pastor bears Mm -hmm. is a very heavy burden, a great responsibility. And I said, and I would always say, unless God calls me to that, I am not going to be putting out my resume to be a pastor. Good answer. (laughs) Uh, So I never... Let's just back it up a bit. You talked about heavy weight, Mm -hmm. lots of responsibility. Mm -hmm. A funeral director, (laughs) what what are we talking about here? Because there is some weight and responsibility to my... exactly. This is... So... So I was I was serving Is this a trade off or what? Right. Um, I I was serving tables for a lot of years yeah. around Essex County and Windsor, and I love serving tables. I love working with people, so I mm-hmm. knew that was one of my passions. Yeah. And I would just pray for God. What do you want me to do? I knew I wanted to do something ministry oriented, because um, that's I feel like if I can do a ministry for my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, what better way to spend my working hours? Exactly. Um, and then I was driving with my sister Vanessa, and we drove past the funeral home, and she goes, "You should be a funeral director." Really, Vanessa? Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> and and I go, "Who would want to be a funeral director? That's so weird. Like, why would I ever want to be yeah. a funeral director?" But then I couldn't shake it. 
Yeah. And so I went to this office and I said, um, I'd like to see what it takes to become a funeral director. Can I volunteer here for 40 hours to see if that's something that I'd be interested in doing? And they said, sir, you're at a cemetery. And that's how little I knew about <laughs> I said, oh, okay. They go, go next door. They're the funeral home. Oh, okay. So I went. The manager was kind enough to give me an opportunity to volunteer for 40 hours, mm-hmm. um, which actually he later paid me for, which was kind. And, and I just, I was like, wow, I can, like, I really felt called to become a funeral director. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's uh, just an opportunity to help make maybe the most difficult time in somebody's life a mm-hmm. little bit easier. Oh, yeah. And, and to be able to do that on a daily basis is, um, is just such a, I'm, I'm very thankful to be able to do that. So that's, that, that's my uh, story. That's your, that's your story. Yeah. That's an awesome story. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you so very much. I really, I really enjoyed this conversation. Okay, and, thanks, man. Uh, and I hope that Likewise. it can speak to some people who are uh, watching. So, God bless great. you too. Yep. Thanks.